My name is uh, Adrian Corbella. I am Dean of European Studies at Tottenham University here in Cluj. Uh, it's an honor to chair this panel, which is dedicated to civic education in Europe with a strong focus on our part of the continent, on East Central Europe, and the Western Balkans as well. And we will uh, listen to a piece of research performed by our colleagues from the Civics Innovation Hub, which is a pan European non profit organization with hubs in Bulgaria, Croatia, and Germany. Founded in uh, 2021 with, by experts with extensive experience in democracy development and civic education, supported by partners in various European countries and advised by stakeholders, philanthropies, experts, and civil education agencies in Europe. Now, among the activities conducted by our colleagues, one can underline learning and exchange, mapping and research, networking and advocacy. There are multiple projects on such topics as climate change, financial literacy, war and education, and so on. But today, uh, in particular, we will become acquainted with a civic education survey launched in 21 countries several months before the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, whose purpose was to a very large degree to assess citizens' commitment to democracy, to the values promoted by the Council of Europe, so as to boost engagement locally and continent-wide. Also, this survey aims to gauge the prominence of civic education in society, in public discourse, to examine the national funding allotted to civic education and to educators, to see to what extent the topic is distorted by political interests, and, of course, a lot of things have changed uh, after the war, the impact of the war uh, in the implementation of this instrument, with Ukraine and Moldova now being amongst its focal points. I wanted to just tell you a message on the part of the university as well. Balastro University is uh, uh, the oldest and uh, at this time the largest university in this country. And the message is also most notably of one of the younger faculties of this university, which is the Faculty of European Studies. Um, where civic education is encountered in what we like to call the triple mission that we attempt to fulfill, which is teaching, research, and community involvement. Uh, as far as teaching is concerned, uh, no doubt about it, we have a very strong emphasis on EU matters, especially on our part of the continent, but especially with a focus on EU values, such as democracy and human rights, which are definitely in the limelight. All the more so because numerous graduates focus on teaching and training later on, uh, with civic education being one of the eligible subjects that our graduates are indeed allowed to teach at national level and even beyond. Then, as far as the research projects are concerned, we have very interesting projects funded by structural funds and the research funds of the European Union, research grants of the Romanian government as well, germane to the Western Balkans, for example, and the extent to which one can transfer some of the integration experience that has been filled with hurdles, quite shaky in the case of Romania and East Central Europe in general, to the Western Balkans, uh, with the idea of initio that this is a mutually beneficial endeavor. It's not about us teaching uh, the Western Balkans from the positive and the negative, and the negative side of European integration, uh, but it's also about learning from this fresh uh, approach and the new way of negotiating and tackling the negotiation chapters in the case of the Western Balkans. And of course, our focus has recently definitely reshifted, I would say, massively towards Moldova and also towards Ukraine, in the case of which Romania has undergone a particularly peculiar, I would say, mutual uh, knowledge endeavor and reacquaintance, if you will, with the authority posed by this very important neighbor uh, that Romania is now open to. And then uh, we have other very interesting projects at the Faculty of European Studies, which are definitely germane to the one that we'll be uh, hearing about today, dealing with such topics as Islamophobia, social inclusion, and gender equality. And finally, community, uh, community action, uh, with the help of our NGO partnerships, most notably with the Ratio Foundation, with uh, others like Patrim. We conduct internships, we have a lot of curriculum development endeavors, we have recent support uh, that is being granted by our partners to the Faculty of European Studies, but we also engage a lot with EU institutions. For instance, on topics again connected to the ones we'll be hearing about today, we have a lot of projects with DGCOM, the European Commission, in order to mobilize the youth as multipliers of European information, to mobilize the youth when it comes to participating in political life in Europe amid election time, for example, for the European Parliament, 
And we also engage a lot with the European Parliament on such topics of national interest as the access or enhanced access to EU funding in Romania, which has been somewhat problematic uh, in the area of public administration and university alike. So we also have a lot of democracy-oriented projects, and we also have a lot of visits on the part of prominent decision makers that uh, are part of these projects. Allow me to just underline two such events. A few months ago, we were very pleased to host the President of the Republic of Moldova, for excellence, my son, with the Faculty of European Studies, because Moldova, as I was telling you before, is a focal point of the projects we're currently implementing at this faculty. And next week, we are equally proud to host the Prime Minister of Iceland, Ms. Katrin Gakostotir, uh, for a very interesting conference uh, and to present her with an award dedicated to her support of gender equality in international politics. So, with this context set in mind, I'm very pleased to extend the floor to our colleagues, Luisa Slavkova and Maya Kudelic, in order to present their research. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and setting the stage uh, to talk about our uh, project, uh, which I'm going to start with a disclaimer. is not a research project. It's a mapping exercise um, on, uh, on civic education in, in Europe. Um, also, to start again with the thanks, uh, I would like to thank the Dorasio Foundation for being the local partner in our mapping in Romania, and also thank to LSE and Dias for promoting the expert opinion pieces, which I will uh, talk about in a minute. Um, and also, of course, uh, we are glad to be here and to uh, present this, uh, this work that we have been doing in the past two years uh, today to, uh, to you. Um, so, let's... Um, slowly start. Um, the mapping is the flagship project of the civics, an um, organization that was now introduced to you. Uh, the aim of the mapping was to identify the main actors of civic education in 21 uh, European countries uh, in non-formal and informal civic education. So the civic education that happens outside of uh, schools. Um, it was conducted in partnership with 22 local partners. Um, and yes, this is not a typo, it's 21 countries and 22 local partners uh, because the survey was conducted in 21 countries, but we have also included Turkey through an expert opinion uh, piece. So local partners were an inevitable part of our project. Uh, they were the focal point for us in, in these countries. Uh, they were translating the questionnaire, uh, they were conducting the initial database of contacts that they were then transferring uh, to, to us, and they were of course promoting the mapping uh, locally in their own ecosystems. And also important to note that the uh, mapping is supported by the German Federal Agency for uh, Civic Education. Um, just a little bit, a glimpse into what we have achieved in the past two years. Uh, we have reached out to almost 3,000 civic educators in 21 countries, uh, out of which 434 have responded to our uh, survey. And uh, this response rate of around 15% is a good response rate in online surveying. Let me assure you, we have had numerous talks with uh, with quantitative experts, because we both uh, felt that there is a need to, to increase the response rate, but due to the fatigue that people feel when, are, when they are always getting into their emails, different types of surveys, um, and also maybe they're not really willing to click on, the, on different links, um, this is the response rate that we have been um, successfully uh, able to achieve. Um, a little bit about the survey, our key uh, areas were um, on the type and civic education topics that these uh, actors are working in, who are their main target groups, what is their financial health, funding sources, capacity building needs, uh, needs for cooperation, networking and peer learning. And uh, more about the findings you'll hear a bit later on from uh, um, however, what we have done is more than the, more than the survey. Uh, we have also included the uh, expert opinion pieces, which were drafted by uh, local partners. And uh, 10 of these expert opinion pieces uh, were featured on an LSE Ideas Red Two Forum blog as a collection of uh, reports, and you can also access them there. The expert opinion pieces um, give 
a setting into a country, um, what is the discourse of civic education, it, they, it gives a glimpse into the formal and more formal civic education and challenges that um, are prevalent in the country. It's only a two-page long document, it's a so-called two-page. Uh, what we, we have also done is the online network visualization of civic educators that we have been able to reach, and I will show you this uh, briefly now. Um, so, let's jump into this. Here is the map that we have, uh, that we have created. It's an interactive uh, tool uh, covering all the countries that we have currently mapped. So maybe just um, for an exercise, joint exercise, uh, we can go into Romania. Uh, once you click uh, to select a country, you see where the majority of actors are. Uh, and then you can click on show the network. And now this is going to load. Wi Fi is not this <laughs> Okay, so there it is. So, what we have done apart from the survey is we have also uh, reached out to these actors so, and we asked them who they cooperate with in their countries. Uh, to be able to show um, their relations on an interactive map. Let's um, just click on something random. Um, <laughs> it's a small network. It doesn't load, it should be here. Okay. Then in a better setting, maybe it would be you, you would be able to see the connections between these actors. Maybe you can try it again a bit later. And also, when you click on a certain actor, on the right-hand side, uh, you see their profile, with a contact person, email, website, and the type of um, organization they are and the main field of work. So just imagine if you were an organization sitting in, let's say, Croatia, and you want to find a partner in Romania who works in culture and arts, this would be the tool that you would use um, to facilitate you finding a partner and jointly going to, um, to uh, applicate for, for different projects. Um, map comes with uh, quite a lot of uh, features. You can sort the map um, by location, legal status, founding year, and you can also filter um, in the map, of, for example, main field of work, and then the map changes accordingly as you are doing this. Um, I'll give you now a moment if you wish to, and um, you can scan the QR code and um, just have the map visible on your phones, or also type the, type the uh, link, which is down here. Um, uh, and then if later you will have any questions about the map itself, uh, we can go over it uh, through in the Q&A session. Um, it's okay, I'll just uh -huh. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Every <laughs> second. <laughs> Did it work? So, yes. There is one. <laughs> so um, you will then have now the possibility to go to the map on your phones. Um, maybe it's a bit more adjusted to use it on computers, but also on the on the phones it uh, works uh, as well. Um, what we are doing at the moment, we are continuing with uh, ten more countries in 2023. Uh, but also civic educators from the countries that we already mapped can um, be put on the map um, afterwards. There is a form that can be filled, so also if you would be interested in that or you know a civic educator that could be uh, put on the map to let us, uh, to let us know. And the uh, last um, output of our project is the uh, report that was co-authored with Luisa um, together with me. Uh, titled Great Expectations, Demands and Realities of Civic Education in Europe. We have brought a couple of copies here as uh, much of the luggage and post uh, were allowing us to. Um, and now after I have uh, done a brief uh, introduction into how we have um, implemented this project, um, I'll be uh, giving the word to Luisa to talk about the comparative findings, uh, patterns and trends in civic education. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thanks a lot. So, hello everyone, one more time to those we, um, we haven't had the chance to meet yesterday. My name is Louisa, as uh, my um, and our colleague um, uh, from the university introduced us. What I'm going to be doing in the next couple of minutes is to talk a little bit about the findings from the surveys Maya introduced and the so-called opinion-based neglected. 
And I think listening to some of you since yesterday um, who were trying to figure out who we are, what we do, and who the heck are civic, the civic educators, so what's civic education, right? So I heard someone say, oh, I have civic education in school, I do not have civic education, but this already points us to the, the biggest maybe challenge in the field that we're facing. Broadly speaking, civic educators are those who are in one way or another consciously or subconsciously invested in building, maintaining, boosting a democratic political culture in any given society, right? So this is a very broad definition. A civic educator could be a curator of an exhibition. In our language, we would call that an informal civic educator because they actually did an exhibition which did not have an aim to you know, promote democracy, they did something else, but as a side effect, because it touched on a topic of I don't know, migration or um, equity, equality, they, as a side effect, were having this educational effect on those who went to see the exhibition. Non-formal civic educators, again, in our language, are those like us in civil society, like you at university, who do different programs, projects that somehow have this educational effect that is having an impact on the political culture of cultural and what we call formal civic educators are those who do classes at school that follow the national curriculum. Every country has that. Romania has one, one as well. I think all the countries that are represented in the room, in your countries, there are these official curricula that span over to uh, formal education, to schools, but also sometimes to, to, university, um, to university programs. And so we, as we started as an organization in the middle of the pandemic, 2021, we have these two big questions in mind. On the one hand, what is the contemporary definition of a good citizen? And I'm pretty sure, even though we're a pretty like-minded group of people in this room, if I asked you that question, we would probably come up with 60 different ideas about what's a good citizen today. The second question we have in our minds is then, who are the civic educators of the 21st century? So who are the ones that actually promote uh, political culture, culture to, to, to date? And you can argue um, that it's not civil society. So the way that they started, in the beginning, we started talking about political parties and elites. Then we moved over to talk about media. And I was reminded of a, um, of a quote that I um, actually just found on the, on, the, on the plane. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this writer, probably many of you are. Jan van Amuda, he became very famous in the, around the conversation of populism. He's a key researcher on that German, German-American, I believe. So he has a chapter where he talks about the infrastructure that is necessary for a democracy to be sustained. And in that chapter, he calls it critical infrastructure. He says, um, he focuses on the so-called intermediary institutions for democracy. And he focuses on media and he focuses on political parties. And in a footnote, he says the following. One might ask why the discussion is limited to parties and media and does not include other institutions that are usually seen as intermediaries, such as NGOs, trade unions, and employer associations. I don't mean to deny the importance of the latter, but to put it bluntly, one can imagine a representative democracy without them, whereas one cannot conceive one of one without parties and media. I'm very curious to hear from you what you think about it. I think at least our friends at LC Ideas and the Ratio Forum do not agree with him because otherwise Maya and I would not be here today. So back to the question, who are the civic educators of the 21st century? That's what we wanted to figure out. We wanted to find out who are the ones, apart from media and political parties obviously, who have an impact on forming this political democratic culture of, um, of people, voters across Europe, especially young. So we designed that questionnaire that we talked about and we sent it out to thousands of, um, of organizations, individuals that our local partners like the Ratsum Forum in Romania collected for us. So we told them, this is our definition of a civic educator. They are in museums, sometimes they're in community centers, sometimes they're in libraries, they're also in universities, but they're also um, you know, influencers on YouTube and, and, and social media and on Instagram. In a particular database that is GDPR compliant, so we can send out this questionnaire to them and ask them to fill it, to fill it out. So the results that we're presenting today that are also put in this, this report are based on these 430-something responses, plus these so-called opinion pieces. Um, we ask each of our partners to write them, because this is, the, this is the piece of information that provides the local context, because the answers are just answers. We compile the information together, but then we need to step on something. 
we are sitting in three different countries in Europe, we are now experts on everyone and everything. So the, the country profiles actually turn to be, these opinion pieces turn to be really useful for us to place the data in the, in the local, um, local context. So we clustered the report um, in a couple of chapters. The one is um, the description of the data country by country. So those of you who are really interested to, let's say, look into what's the, the field of civic education in Albania can just open the chapter in Albania. Those of you who want to know what's happening in Luxembourg can do the same thing for Luxembourg. What we're going to talk about now is the comparative compiled data that is focusing on these 430-something um, responses, mind that there are obviously also local differences as well. But this is the level of generalization that I'm going to be um, talking about today. Um, Takeaway one, this course surrounding civic education matters obviously a lot. And it's the same that's uh, surrounding the whole the big topic of democracy. So those challenges that democracy faces, faces by and large are the same challenges that civic educators um, are meeting in their daily work. Why is that? I mean, pretty, pretty, pretty easy, I think. In times of crisis, of, a, of you know, in a, in a democracy, um, it's a little bit. Civic educators have the same job as uh, I would say the doctors and the nurses during the pandemic. They're in the forefront, but it takes a little bit of time to realize that, right? So we can talk a lot about the importance of media and political elites and parties, but I think in a day-to-day -day job, in a small community center, in a small community, in a library. It's those who work in those institutions that are actually facing people's reactions, real people's reactions. No, it's not like on social media there are anonymous comments. They're the ones, they are the ones who actually need to have interactions with people and say, this is actually a conspiracy theory, if that's what the conversation is, conversation is all about. So all the different topics, the topics that we're talking um, about by and large that are challenging democracy today are the challenges that also civic educators are facing in their day-to-day in day. -to -day, day, -to -day. Day-to-day um, -day job, um, but this course matters also for a different reason. I started with this question: What makes a good? What makes someone into a good um, citizen? Civic education in some countries becomes a absolutely political battlefield, especially in countries where there is a lot of conversation around what's our national identity, um, what is you know, um, how much does a, does is our national identity focused in our history in the past? So as long as in a country there is no clear idea and consensus around the different of <coughs> the society, um, what, the, what, what makes up their national identity, civic education becomes a battlefield because parties also very well understand that civic education is one of these um, subjects, especially in school, that has the great power to, you know, to, to frame people in a, in, a, in a certain way. So that together with history and literature, I think, has that great potential um, to, to prime, prime, especially young people, in a, in a certain way. This is also why you've been seeing so many changes in the curricula in, uh, uh, in Hungary, but also in, uh, in Poland, for example. So that's, uh, that matters. Um, the, talking about the formal, formal education, we have a little chapter or a little section that looks into that, because even though the whole report focuses on non-formal and informal, this is also an important aspect of, of the whole um, context of, of civic education. In the different countries that we studied, um, each of them has civic education one way or another. Some countries take the so-called competence-based approach, which means there is no single subject that does civic education, but you have different civic competences that are taught or supposed to be taught in math, biology, sports, arts, literature, history, etc., etc. That approach is a tricky one because um, you, it's very difficult to measure whether these competences actually have been, uh, have been taught or not. Interestingly, when you look into, again, that area of formal civic education, you also understand what a crucial role civil society plays, especially when it comes to training the teachers. So usually ministries of education have very traditional didactical trainings for teachers. Civil society actually brings in all the interactive methods, all the innovation, uh, you know, all the, all the cool and new exciting ideas, as in how teachers can make actually teaching a little bit more relevant for, for, for young people. Now moving on to the actual um, uh, takeaways from the comparative comparative data. A couple of graphs for you just for information. Um, this is one that looks into the geographical reach of, um, of civic educators. What you would see is obviously was not a big surprise. Um, the majority of them have a local and a national impact. 
So this means they're very much invested in their own communities, where they live, where they operate, or on a national level. Um, the regional pops up mostly there, where either the countries are bigger and decentralized or organized in a federal way. I think this is also not a surprise. But to us, it was a surprise to see um, that international cooperation is actually uh, uh, not that big. We would have thought that the majority of them would actually have at least one or two international projects. So this is actually a good takeaway for us that we translated in a recommendation to say there is an opportunity to boost international work. Um, for those that are invested in democracy, generally, generally speaking. Um, some of the key topics that we work on, I think this also shows a pretty traditional picture of civic educators. So they're interested in what you would call civic engagement and participation. Participation alludes to political participation, and civic engagement alludes more to you know, the classical type of um, either activism, uh, uh, etc. Social inclusion is a very, very big topic. Uh, alongside with um, community building uh, for civic educators as well, which is something I think positive because this means there is a lot of, there is a great proximity to the target groups. We sometimes, when we talk about democracy on a meta level, we would think it's all about talking about uh, rights and duties, but actually, civic education on a local level looks in a you know, tends to take different different forms and forms and shapes, and so that in order for it to be close to the to the target groups, to people that civic educators work with, it has to um, focus on a lot of uh, social inclusion and community building building topics. Civil rights um, is another one we picked. I think here the first, the top um, top five. But in the report, you can see um, more. I think at times when we talk a lot about digital competences, uh, media literacy, disinformation. It's also notable to see that at least we haven't been able to reach too many civic educators who do that type of work, or if that's um, a really the, uh, the reality, the majority of civic educators do not actually focus on media literacy programs. Uh, so that's also another area maybe to look into why that, why that is. Then um, moving on to a question which I think um, is interesting for, uh, uh, for, for many of you in the room. Since we started the mapping at the beginning of the, uh, it coincided with the beginning of the war, and initially we wanted to also map uh, countries like Ukraine and Moldova in the, um, in the project. We were not able to do so for obvious reasons, but we included, um, we included the question, what was the impact of the war in Ukraine on your work? Um, only for some of the countries. You would see that five are missing because the five countries were the so-called pilot countries for us, where we did a trial and error um, run. But in here you can see, you can see it. to us this was in the beginning surprising, and then when we thought about it, it was not surprising anymore. Those countries that were impacted, or that the organizations whose work was impacted by the war are those that are close, um, geographically closer to Ukraine. Everyone else, um, hardly, hardly any impact, not to mention that there are countries where um, you know, semi no no uh, no impact of the of the war. The moving on to um, so-called target groups. So the question was, who do you work with? Who do you focus on? Not a big surprise. Everyone wants to work with young people, and I think you know why. Because um, this is where opinions, attitudes, values uh, uh, are easier to change, um, easier to uh, you know to have an impact on. The older we get, the more rigid we become, even if we think of ourselves differently. Um, however, there is an asterisk here. It was very interesting that in societies with um, an increasingly aging population, or at least where there is the awareness of that, because I think all European societies are aging, countries like the Benelux countries or Finland are the countries where um, you have a notable section of civic educators who work with people 65 and above which means um, there is a lot of room to work in with, with people 65, as the 65 as well, exactly because of that reason. You have seen, I guess, demographical research that does show um, how, the, how the balance is, is, is changing. And so the more our societies are changing, are aging, the more work will have to also um, happen in the field of working with citizens above 65, um, exactly for the fact that, um, you know, we have all the guys who will be deciding for young for younger people and for their futures. So it's good to um, it's good to keep being civically minded uh, as we as we age. We've also asked not only about their profile in terms of age, but also 
um, whether they work with local professional groups, for example, do they do teacher trainings, or um, do they work with people with migration background, or with people who have learning disabilities. So it, there is the list is really very long. In there too, you would see regional differences. For example, um, working with um, so-called needs. So these are young people who are outside of education, outside of a job. You have organizations working with them in countries that have very high levels of youth unemployment, like Southern Europe. You have countries like Greece working with migrants, but in the rest of the countries as well. Again, so these things are very local, really. Um, then moving on to the next section of questions we had, it was all revolving around methods and tools that um, educators use. And again, we were really trying at the end to come up with a profile to see you know, are there any great innovators in civic education? What I think this continuous painting is a picture of somewhat traditional civic educators, I would say. So they do a lot of workshops and trainings, they do a raising, um, awareness raising campaigns, capacity building, so these are trainings to improve your, um, your capacities um, at what you do. They do publications, they use some digital tools, you know, study trips. I think you also mentioned some of, some of these activities in your work at the university. So I think you also fit, fit into the, the profile. You know, artistic performances, so-called service learning, very tiny percentage uses actually um, stuff like, um, you know, uses AI or printed reality tools in their, um, in their work. Um, this section actually nicely couples with a question that comes a little later in our questionnaire, which was looking at the uh, capacity building needs. And you would see the exactly reverse picture. They would say, we want to learn about what is new out there, what is impactful, what are new tools, how can we galvanize this whole AI revolution out there for our, actually, for our purposes. Moving on to, um, to maybe one of the most, uh, on the one hand, shocking and surprising, on the other hand, less so findings. We have a whole section that looks into the funding landscape, looking into um, who are your main, your main sources of funds, um, how much uh, resources do you devote to so-called core costs? So this is all that covers stuff in your, um, you know, office, utilities, and so-called activities costs that are going to the actual work you were doing with the, with the people you work with. Um, first thing was it confirmed the invisible rule of the 37%, which is to say always 30% of the majority of organizations have 30% of their budget going to um, going to uh, staff, and 70% is going to activities. Now, when you look at the number above, um, telling you that 42% of the respondents operate on a budget that's more than 100,000 per year, and you apply the 30 to 70% rule, you would see that in order for them to cover their, um, their staff costs, they have around 30,000 euros uh, or less per year, which is uh, less than 3,000 euros per month, and I think you can do your own um, mathematic and arithmetics to actually know at the end of the day um, how many people they can employ. That's a very small number of a core, core stuff you can have. You were due to work with um, experts that you pay a fee to or with volunteers, and there is very little continuity that you can actually secure, secure over time. So that's why Maya and I decided to have this number that big, so, um, so we actually remember that. that if we match this, the reason why we call the report Great Expectations, Demands and Realities Not Meeting, it's just to keep in mind that, you know, on the one hand, civic educators somehow on the forefront of uh, the fight for more democracy, and on the other end, it's this financial, uh, financial reality that they are um, actually uh, living. Moving on to um, a question that was related to um, the so-called capacity building needs. So we asked the question: If we, if you were to choose what kind of trainings you would like to have, what would that be? So they focused a lot on um, methods, tools, and approaches, new stuff. They really would like to, you know, like to innovate, but they don't don't have access to to, to that. Impact evaluation and learning. That's also interesting um, because I think there is growing awareness that you know you need to be able to measure over an extended period of time what's your actual impact. Um, an impact on changing, you know, um, values and attitudes. It's difficult to measure, but there is the awareness that there is a need to measure that because I think also at the end of the day, civil society doesn't want to be doing work just for the sake of doing it. They also, we also want to know that uh, there's there is an added value over time. Funding continues being, uh, you know, a big topic for for half of the half the organizations out there. 
innovation for site as a method, that's a big topic. We uh, figure out to uh, organizations who like to really learn um, how to think ahead, both when it comes to planning their own work, but also in anticipating what are what are maybe crises that are coming. Now it's um, now it's the war. Uh, now it's uh, it's climate change over quite some time. But who knows what's coming in, in a couple of years from from now? So they would like to really know what's ahead of ahead of them. Communication uh, and there are a few more details in the report about that. I think it goes in different directions. But the one thing is really about learning how to effectively talk about what you're doing, but also being better at reaching the ones you actually you want to work with, so your target groups. And um, lastly, also um, how to build impactful um, uh, advocacy and outreach strategies. So how to have actually an impact on policymakers, maybe, and, and other other stakeholders. And then uh, last two uh, uh, last two slides and graphs. Um, we asked them, you know, would you would you like to have more opportunities to learn from each other? And this is so interesting for us. We did not expect this this picture. Um, the majority of of, of, um, of the organizations, big educators, we um, inquired actually would like to have more exchange in their own countries. So this for us has been such an encouragement to go back to all our local partners and say there's so much potential for you to create a local network for those who are invested in these topics. There are minor exceptions of those who would actually prefer to prefer to talk to um, to their peers outside of their country. Um, so I can only uh, say that in this room too, there is room to do local uh, civic education networks um, in your in your own countries. Last slide. Um, for now, um, we also asked the question about um, if there were a pan-European network, would you like it? Uh, what would you like it um, to do for 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 the review? And then this also, I think, um, correlates nicely with some of the other um, some of the other questions and, and findings we've got. Opportunities to work internationally. You remember in the, one of the first slides that was the area which uh, which was under um, utilized. I would say so. That's it's great to see that. The, potential and the desire is there. Um, exchange of good practices, again, exchange of the latest tools and trends and methods that there is need really for, um, for that. Opportunities for joint projects nationally. Again, to the previous slide, apparently civic educators would like to work more closely together in networks. But sometimes, you know, um, civic, civic society content is usually on a competitive way. So maybe this is sometimes also preventing civil society from coming together and working together because they have to compete for the same Resources, so there is there is room to to think about it, um, and uh, I think I will um, put a whole stop here, and it would be really lovely to um, to hear your thoughts, questions, remarks. Um, Thank you so much, Lisa and Mark, for all this piece of research and for mapping the situation of, uh, of civil education, civil education in Europe. It's a topic that is growing at the level of the university. And it's been included as a transversal topic for teacher training. Mm -hmm. So this is a positive sign. We've also done a lot of curriculum development. Mm -hmm. This could be a, an interesting point to exchange on a matter of curriculum, uh, how to develop a curriculum in European studies in order to include more components, germane for civic education. And that is because that is for chiefly for two reasons, I would say. First of all, we have the experience of Romanian schools, and unfortunately, civic education is one of those topics which is still not always taken very seriously. It's kind of a pseudo universal topic that can be molded into whatever the immediate needs of the community, of the, the school community, uh, may be. Uh, so, there are major gaps, of course, that we notice at university level as well in terms of civic behavior, participation in uh, democratic. Uh, in democratic, uh, let's say, choices. Uh, there's also how students see the roles of NGOs in terms of promoting democracy. This is the number one topic. And number two topic, uh, we still engage uh, when we do our community work. A lot of uh, students, a lot of young people who ask questions about the war in Ukraine uh, tend mm -hmm. to seek information in the wrong places, not never having been taught where to do so, tend to cast blame on a party which is not necessarily in keeping with our views on the war and so on. But the need for this topic is paramount. So with this in mind, please allow me to open the floor for questions and comments on your part. I am very ignorant of what you 
described to us, which I found fantastic, which is uh, clear. I have two lines. In to me, the structure for democracy, value and attitude. These are the, for me, are the symbols of it. Now, one question. Why you have never mentioned the entrepreneurs? Because, let me give you an example. When I went to Babish Bar in 2005 in this country, and with the, as a company, so why did we get together? We clearly had an impact on value and attitude. When Michelin opens a factory in Zalando and it's, it teaches safety, uh, education for your kids with the blue color is important, that is clearly an intermediate uh, structure for democracy. In a world that this is not very fashionable to say, multinational pro pro probably have more impact than government in many, many things. So, my question to you is I haven't heard one sentence of, about you cooperating with big companies which are uh, ethically distant, let's say, not the way to buy. Why is that? Is that because it's out of scope? Or, or why, why do you mention this? I love the question um, because I think this would have been the fourth panel for today. Um, let me so let me talk context a little bit. The it's business, it's, businesses are on our radar. They were just not the focus of this of this mapping. In this mapping, what we wanted to figure out is really what's happening, broadly speaking, in, within civil society. But you're absolutely right that work is a place of informal um, civic education. A couple of years ago, um, the I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with the so-called Edelman Trust Barometer. A couple of years ago, what started becoming notable in the barometer is that the levels of trust of people are changing. Whereas years ago, they would trust predominantly their elected institutions, political institutions, their you know, elected officials. That started changing um, by levels of trust dropping vis-a-vis -vis elected um, officials and levels of trust rising when it comes to the, to the businesses to a point where the most trusted elements in the society uh, were the businesses, not civil society, not academia, not you know political parties, etc. This was a moment where we as civic educators said, why don't we do a civic education program in companies? We're running a pilot, which we started in the beginning of this year in four countries, that's um, Hungary, uh, Croatia, Germany, and Bulgaria. And I have to tell you, at least speaking from the Bulgarian example, how difficult it's been actually to convince companies why it's important for them to participate we, as a pilot, we have in, into the country six companies lined up. They are participating, they're working with us. We designed programs that are addressing competences or values and attitudes that they find both important for their company culture, but also for their employees as citizens as part of their communities. But this has been um, quite a conversation. And maybe it's a little bit on our end that we do not uh, speak the business language. Maybe we must have been, um, you know, must have had a, an argument in the beginning that says more socially minded um, employees mean more profits for you. If you can help us draft that argument, um, I think we will give you the instead of society equivalent of a Nobel Award. <laughs> but, no, but let me tell you this. Yeah, so this is the. This is the why I'm here? Because one day I received a phone call from Indrea who asked me. Make, uh, we were making steel. Do you have onions? I said, onions? I need onions for the Tulta. Uh, the the, the, the onion strip, the longest on the street. The longest on yeah. It's a civic <clears throat> value and attitude formation because the argument was that after communism, you have to put people together. I immediately provided one pattern of onions. You remember, it's very funny. And I said, wow, these are Romanian subjects. Fantastic. This is a genius idea. So what the, that's that's why I'm here. I mean, thanks to Nicolai and uh, Nicolai, but that's how it began. And that is clearly them calling a company that makes something totally different 
He just says, we need to back up. <laughs> right. So, so, so I think I think there is an enormous place there, and I have witnessed this in education, university, collaboration, safety, health and safety, education for people of color in Indonesia. An enormous pain in the party. So, so my question to you is then, how can we share your phone number with more so that more people can be joining us? Through this table of relationship. Through the answer is through that. Yes. They work yes. with us on a permanent basis. We do. We actually do. I mean, at no point in the past have we worked so intensely with the business environment. And this is something that's been learned in a hard way. First of all, through the needs of our students, to the A's, with the business community, with the future. Uh, employers who are becoming more and more, I don't know, um, I would say, um, critical of the types of competences in the, in the past years that universities were instilling in students. And uh, now we have a whole new mentality when it comes to open this doors companies. And there is a lot of uh, civic uh, element, or a lot of civic element involved in this cooperation, for sure. And maybe we have another truckload of onions. Onions, we're a bit short. Um, from the uh, questionnaire and the analysis that you, which you did of it, we were able to, to determine <clears throat> the level of, of, of interest uh, in the younger generation in, in learning and having these on the, on the curriculum or in whichever way it was done to learn about civic society and how to contribute to civic society in ways that we could in democracy and so we're able to determine whether there's a growth in, in that interest or a decline. So that's going to be a convoluted way to answer your question. Um, we haven't surveyed young people directly, but we have surveyed the organizations to ask if they work with young people. So the majority of them focus on young people. That's what we, we know for sure. But that's not a surprise because I think generally civil society is uh, over proportionally focusing on, on young people. But what we have been learning looking at youth studies that are done in different European countries, and there is going to be now more and more coming before the European elections uh, for Parliament next year, is a couple of things. First of all, the last cohort of the Generation Z and the upcoming Alpha that are now the you know, 11, 12, 13 year old ones. They learn in a very different way compared to us, compared to the generations afterwards, after 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 us, uh, as a bit more experienced. First of all, they are hyper individualistic, meaning that they create their own world and space by having access online to so many different sources. So, which is basically, I mean, to say, political parties especially have it very different, difficult in, in nowadays to target, you know, to have one party with message. That's the one thing, hyper individualistic. The second one is they learn very differently, also from our generation and from previous generations, which means they're extremely interactive. So a teacher who does not design an interactive class has lost them after the 15 minutes recently. Um, so sometimes we you know, complain about bad results in PISA, but I think there's so much to be said about the ways of teaching. This goes for you know, this goes for history the way the same way it goes actually for for, uh, for civic civic education. The third thing is, and there is some interesting research um, done in a country like Slovakia, for example. They did ask the question: When you want to know something about politics or what's going on, where do you go to? And they would name a couple of you know basically famous personalities. It's either a tennis player or it's an influencer or whatnot. This is why we also, in the questionnaire, have tried, or in the database, we have tried to reach out to a couple of um, social media influencers just to see how popular they are, in which countries are they, and they are everywhere, obviously. But apparently, because of the access they have to young people, because of the fact that young people are on, on TikTok or on Instagram and, and whatnot, um, they somehow seem to be that um, 21st century civic educator no one really talks about. Already has on popular radar, so this was a this was an interesting thing. And I think the last note, which is coming again not from our research but from youth studies, is that um, around the age of 12, 13, 
this is the time when young people start trusting less and less their families and start trusting more whatever is considered to be their other environment. This is friends, this is sometimes school really, and then you know social influencers and all that. So this seems to be a very critical point also when it comes to teaching formal civic education, so for the school teaching of the subject actually, that that's an important time to start um, sort of putting more emphasis on these civic, civic values and um, I have, I have a question related to that. Uh, is it possible to get the, the slide that has the different aspects of civic education being sharp? We can also show you a, like more, history a, much, more, and, a much more detailed one on that. Yeah, one. that one, yeah, yeah. Um, on the other part of the graph, you wrote down a question to your partners by age, and it was over 75%, probably 16 to 29 year olds, and less than 25%. Uh, Target 65 plus year olds. Mm -hmm. Is anyone knowing whether there's a change in targeted field of work to age groups? So, for example, for example, the 65 plus is that very different to, as you said, those with 13, 16? We didn't do any process. We didn't yeah. do any process. But the database will, is open. So <laughs> the database is open. Yeah. This is, I mean, anyways, just to, to, to add a little more detail to that, the we, we have a whole chapter on recommendations. One of them is obviously to come together as a committee to try to sort out our language. Do we call this civic education? Uh, do we call this citizenship education? Do we call this education for democracy? Do we call this education for <coughs> civic engagement? Do we call this values education? What, what, is, what is this whole thing? Because if a field were to you know, understand itself as such, it needs to also have some common language. Um, so, you know, so that recommendation along with take the data, um, maybe make a, I don't know, to take the example of Romania, make a national panel where you have a number of researchers, you have a number of think tankers come together and see what is the next step we can take from here. How can we improve the data, maybe collect a little bit more, go on the um, qualitative side, because this is purely quantitative and it's obviously small samples. But if once you, I think, start going into a qualitative, this is something that colleagues in um, Spain have done now, they done a follow up of this line that's only focused on, on Spain, but they actually have um, actionable insights from that additional mapping that they want to now translate into strategies for um, both for private foundations like um, the Razzo Foundation, but also for the work of civil society organizations. So I have a nerdy research question. This is not research, we call it mapping. Yeah, yes. mapping. Well, mapping is for research, for analysis. So, your analysis is mostly district, right? Yeah. Have you thought about building the next step in the inference, in the sense in which you seem to have data which would enable you to also answer an important question about effectiveness, the success of civic education? Under what conditions do we know that certain approaches are effective or not? Right? You identify some negative cases, you identify some negative positive cases, and you see the difference. So maybe that's one step further, right? One way of developing the project is further by looking at how do you measure I put putting the mirror here. <laughs> we, would, we would love to have uh, colleagues, you know, come with ideas uh, and say, you know what, we think this data is so useful, we want to take the next step. I think what's important for us now is really to um, try to complement the map of Europe. We have 21 countries that represent different European regions. Now we are doing another 10 countries, but by that, the whole of Europe is not done. Um, so we will not be able to map uh, Ukraine for some time. Um, we, there are you know, gaps in the Western Balkans. Uh, we, can, you know, we can go on and on. There is an idea for us that these commission um, colleagues in Ukraine and colleagues also in Russia will continue doing an uh, important oppositionary job to give us just a short description of who is still active, what exactly are they trying to do, so that they are on the, on this map and on our radar. Um, but yeah, I think the next step is really for the professional academics to uh, to make. Mm -hmm. That's a similar question to uh, my colleague here. Uh, it's fascinating, by the way. Thank you. Uh, one thing I failed to see is how do you measure this success? Mm -hmm. um, as in any sector, anyway, in business, 
You measure, it works, you fix it. It doesn't work, you correct it. So, what are your methods? So, a general answer to begin with. The topic of how you measure the impact of civic education is a very tricky one. Mm -hmm. Usually, civic educators do not like that question because this is this is a. I mean, I'm not speaking for, for myself. I like the question. Um, it's a question. So, how do you when, for example, there are different different there are different ways to measure impact in the work you generate in civil society. The basic thing that is done is usually you try to do a basic questionnaire at the beginning of some activity and you repeat the same questionnaire maybe at the beginning just to try to detect some, some changes. When you look at the more serious studies about civic education, these are usually the ones that are longitudinal. So where in a repeated activity you're actually able to detect some changes over time. But what's very tricky is to eliminate the uh, you know intervening variables of that. So to so to say, how can you one hundred percent know that it's it going to have that impact on the civic mindedness of people and not not something something else that happened in that, that environment? So that's a very 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 tricky tricky question. What we so we we haven't really asked in our questionnaire. Do you think your work is successful or impactful? But what we have done is we have reached out to local partners in these 21 countries and we have asked them, can you put together for us a list of organizations who, in your opinion, do civic education and who also do a pro-democratic type of civic education? They are not the ones who would encourage you to, I don't know, go and vote for you, keep, for example, right? So because there is a difference too, or not the ones who are anti-LGBT rights or, or et cetera, et cetera. So that's been the filter for us to know that these organizations are in some way, in some way legitimate. Um, and I think in any ways, because the work of civil society generally is so-called project-based, when organizations and entities apply for funding, they need to have a so-called theory of change. So you need to be able to show um, what's your, uh, you know, what's your impact over an extended period of time. But a last asterisk. Since such programs are oftentimes short, um, uh, short lived, so they're either six months or twelve months. Rarely is civil society funding three years funding. You can imagine how much of an impact you can actually showcase within three months. Yes. Yeah. Even if you've got two months or six months, you can still do an experiment. A full experiment in which you get two groups, treatment group, control yeah. group. Yeah. I think the question is not, not only about what you can do, you can certainly do a lot of things, but A, organizations do not have that knowledge in-house, B, oftentimes funds do not come with that additional um, aspect of actually allowing you to do that measurement. So, this is also an aspect we talk about in the uh, recommendations of the report that we have, as Maya said at the beginning, we have taken copies here, we also have it online for those of you who to read these uh, things digitally, um, there's a little bit of that as well. Just maybe one more point on the, on the impact. I feel like the, the, I think the whole aim of the mapping was not to assess whether these organizations are successful or not. It was more to paint a picture of what is currently the status of civic education in Europe. So this was where we were coming from. Yes, please. It's sort of a follow-on. Um, I'm looking at that, that slide, and I suppose the question I would have is um, what do the people you talk to say in response to a question? So what is your preferred area of work in civic engagement, which is rather different from what you actually do? What is your preference? And looking ahead, would that preference be different? From what it is now. In a way, it's a spin on the experiment point. But it would, it would just going to the back of that slide, you generate some quite interesting qualitative, qualitative data which might help later on in the tricky business of attractiveness. So it's just a, a footnote to that. Okay, thank you. We're at the moment um, editing the, the questionnaire. So we actually have a talk next week, and maybe we will then take this point and uh, discuss it further. Uh, better to include the preferred field of work. 
Um, maybe also a side note, uh, there has been, we have just put a couple of potential answers to the graph, there has been uh, multiple. Uh, are you, do you want to say something? Yeah, just on, I'm just looking at, depending upon which country you're looking at and the political <coughs> experience, experience of conflict, um, views on the importance of history and remembrance might be kind of different. Exactly. And, and of course, which group <coughs> they're teaching civic education to. I mean, you know this, I'm sure, but I'm just asking that slide could, be, could generate some very interesting qualitative additional data without going off on another different direction. This is, uh, this is the point that maybe we didn't underline enough. Uh, these are the average responses, and the responses uh, differ from country to country. Okay. Uh, we have a whole web page dedicated to uh, comparative graphs where you can really see, um, I can show it quickly to you, uh, where you can see um, the differences in between the countries. So it's here. So we have only chosen to show you averages, yeah. but here you can. There's a lot to, to go through. There are a lot of graphs. Yeah. Okay. I would have a question which hopefully will turn out to be quite pragmatic. Uh, even students who apply for political science, European studies, international relations, come with a massive uh, gap in terms of democratic education. And we feel it in the basic things. For example, we have felt the need to include a course on human rights. And it's for the first time this has happened in the faculty, outside law schools. Secondly, uh, they are largely unaware of basic rights and obligations. They have an anti-corruption mindset, but you can't really put your finger on the values that need to be protected within. Uh, they need to overcome a trust paradox. Our students are blindly, often blindly Europhile. They trust the European Union and, and its institutions, which they barely understand, in most cases, before they study uh, and they take out courses. Um, whereas Romanian institutions are quite vulnerable because there is a massive amount of mistrust. In Romanian, I mean, it is okay to criticize, obviously, but criticizing the very idea of the Romanian parliament as an institution can turn out to be extremely harmful to a rather young democracy. So amid such a mindset or amid such uh, difficult experiences that we have, to what extent are you open to or have you attempted to resort to curriculum development with your partners? Because we have the European Social Fund, which is very much at hand for Romania. We have so many projects germane to curriculum development that are being implemented by our university. We have the Erasmus KA2 framework which is generous, flexible, comprises a lot of elements that could be put to good use in the event that we did decide at one point to engage in curriculum development with your expertise. So have you attempted this before? Would you be open to a partnership in this regard? Absolutely. I think the one... I, I think there is a there is always a, a note, to, note to make as in the national context. One of the reasons why the majority of the civic educators that are non-informal, non outside of school, work so closely with young people and with teachers is exactly because they would like to have an impact on the formal sector, because they realize this is where you can have the biggest outreach, basically. Once you have, let's say, I don't know, I don't know how many civic teachers there might be in Romania, there were, but let's say, you know, there are a couple of thousands. If you have access to them, it's a bigger impact than if you try to reach all the young people across the country. No, because once you have the teachers, you've got you've got them, you've got them all. And I think we would be open, or we would be open to work together on curriculum development, but we would also be, you know, encouraging you to say, what is the way for you to maybe build a national coalition of civic education so that you have an impact on the national curriculum? And unfortunately, the third colleague who was supposed to be with us on the panel, who was colleague who was coming from Slovakia, was just like the Ratio Forum, our partner in Slovakia. In a very painful process, they managed after a couple of years to actually build a national Slovak coalition for civic education, which is currently such a player that cannot be ignored, whoever comes in power. And I think this is such a great example to, um, to look up to. Um, because it's a diverse group of organizations, they have different, you know, they work with different stakeholders, 
but they have just become such a such a you know such a player um, they can't um, can't go go around them anymore. This would be the right time for Ukraine because teacher training uh, has pretty much been upgraded at postgraduate mm -hmm. levels. There is now a national standard that has to be applied, and I'm sure that civic education would very much uh, make its way into the curriculum as an emerging topic. We have new requirements, we have new performance indicators for teachers. So if there ever came a time in, this so would be a this would be like Thank you so much. What a beautiful way to you know to, to, to end the panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, just a, a quick remark. I think um, it's very important you mentioned just now that um, young people are quite ignorant. I totally agree. I'm I'm a journalist and I think civic education should be included in school and definitely teaching about the media, its role and, and what it does, because it's quite frightening for me when I see on social media how ignorant some people are about the basic aspects of, of, of uh, media and how it fits into democracy. So I think it's, it's, it's important to do civic education at school. I, I personally think, you know, these kids are going out into the world, it should be um, compulsory. If you allow me, uh, mass media education has not permeated the core curriculum at university level. Unfortunately, Shame. it's reserved yeah, for certain BA lines, certain MA lines that lead towards political science, the world, of course, besides journalism and communication and negotiation and so on. But this would be a very good idea. I mean, we have taken the liberty of doing this, not because the national curriculum demands it, because it demands a lot of things and it gives us ever less flexibility when it comes to designing our curriculum at the PE level, not at the master's level here. Uh, but I think it is definitely, definitely corresponds to a need that we have also identified within the student community. Yeah, even more so for the privacy rules, because now, you know, as a journalist, you can use the garden spot, spit your tongue on the street, take a picture. Now, if it's no, you're not allowed to, you're not. But, you know, the media has a role in the society. It should be able to take pictures. I understand you don't want the picture taken, but people now say, no, 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 you're not allowed, I have all my privacy is guaranteed, you can't take a picture of me, you can't ask me a question, this is, you know, which is actually detrimental to, to you know, democracy, there should be balance there. But it shouldn't be just at the bachelor's level, it should be much, much sooner, because people are very active on social media, studying age 10. So you should catch them while they're active and while they have an opinion and help them uh, have a form thing. Thank you very much. Let's see if there are any more questions or comments on the part of the audience. In that case, I'd like to thank our speakers very much. Uh, thank you, Lisa, thank you, Maya. And I'd also like to extend my gratitude to NSCID as the last year for enabling me to get involved in this event. And we look forward to just uh, taking the next step. Uh, a big one has been set today. Thank you so much. Thank you.